uh, we reached page 302. He's reached the top of the world stair. He's become a borderer of the empire of the sun. And he's become a connection. He linked creation to the eternal sphere. And in his actions, in his nature, his actions framed the movements of the gods. His will took up the reins of cosmic force. So he's the lord of the horse. He's been the lord of the vital forces from the beginning, the, the, the vital horses. But now he's the controller. He's able to control universal forces. But he's still not finished his journey. There's a very important step, further step to be made, which is taken in this next book, book three, the book of the Divine Mother, which we will just make a start on this week. It's on page 305. I read about a page and a half, and then we'll go back to the beginning and look in detail, sentence by sentence. So this is the book of the Divine Mother, and Canto One is called The Pursuit of the Unknowable. All is too little that the world can give. Its power and knowledge are the gifts of time and cannot fill the spirit's sacred thirst. Although of one these forms of greatness are, and by its breath of grace our lives abide. Although more near to us than nearness self, it is some utter truth of what we are. Hidden by its own works, it seemed far off, impenetrable, occult, voiceless, obscure. The presence was lost by which all things have charm. The glory lacked of which they are dim signs. The world lived on, made empty of its cause, like love when the beloved's face is gone. The labor to know seemed a vain strife of mind. All knowledge ended in the unknowable. The effort to rule seemed a vain pride of will, a trivial achievement scorned by time. All power retired into the omnipotent. A cave of darkness 
guards the eternal light. A silence settled on his striving heart. Absolved from the voices of the world's desire, he turned to the ineffable's timeless call. A being intimate and unnameable, a wide, compelling ecstasy and peace felt in himself and all, and yet ungrasped, approached and faded from his soul's pursuit, as if forever luring him beyond. Near it retreated, far it called him still. Nothing could satisfy but its delight. Its absence left the greatest actions dull. Its presence made the smallest seem divine. When it was there, the heart's abyss was filled. But when the uplifting deity withdrew, existence lost its aim in the inane. The order of the immemorial planes, <clears throat> the godlike fullness of the instruments, were turned to props for an impermanent scene. But who that mightiness was, he knew not yet. Impalpable, yet filling all that is, it made and blotted out a million worlds and took and lost a thousand shapes and names. It wore the guise of an indiscernible vast, or was a subtle kernel in the soul. A distant greatness left it huge and dim, a mystic closeness shut it sweetly in. It seemed sometimes a figment or a robe, and seemed sometimes his own colossal shade, a giant doubt overshadowed his advance. Which way are we reading you? Yes. All is too little that the world can be. Its power and knowledge are the gifts of time and cannot fill the spirit's sacred thirst. Hmm. So King Aswapati has explored all the plains, seen everything, conquered all the levels, but all that the world can give is too little. It's not enough. <clears throat> because its power and knowledge are the gifts of time. It's, they, it, it all belongs to this universe of space and time in which everything is changing Achievements last for a certain time, 
and then they are gone. No? So these things that are the gifts of time, they cannot fill the sacred thirst of the spirit which longs for the infinite and the eternal. All that the world can give. Hmm? or the, the power and knowledge of the world, we can say. So we go on f chasing one goal after another, and right maybe to the top of the universe, but then we, we know for sure that all is too little that the world can give. There must be something more to fill the spirits sacred thirst. Although one these forms of greatness are, by its breath of grace our lives abide. Although more near to us the nearness self, it is some utter truth of what we are, hidden by its own world it seemed far off, impenetrable, occult, voiceless, obscure. All these forms in the universe, however great power, knowledge, they are forms of the one, the one reality, the un one essential reality. These are all forms of it, more or less expressive. And if it weren't for the breath, the grace breath of that one, uh, we couldn't live at all. We wouldn't be alive. By its breath of grace, our lives abide. We wouldn't exist if it weren't for that breath of grace. Hmm? It is n nearer to us, it's more near to us than nearness self. Everything that we experience as near, that one is nearer to us than that. He says it is some utter truth, one ultimate absolute truth of what we are. And it seems, well it is, hidden by all these forms and actions. It's hidden by its works. Everything that it has created, everything that it has put out of itself. Hmm? So it seemed, even to King Aswapati at that high stage of development, that one seemed far away, something that could not be penetrated, impenetrable, there was no way of entering into it. It's occult, hidden, voiceless, it doesn't speak or communicate, and so it seems obscure, mysterious, inexplicable, a kind of darkness. Hmm? If the presence was lost by which all things have charmed, the glory light of which they are deep signs. The world lived on made Live the world lived on made empty of its cause, yeah? The world lived on, made empty of its cause. Like love, when the beloved face is gone. Yes. So there's a presence, a divine presence, which gives charm to things. King Aswapati experienced, he had a glimpse of that one, whose presence gives charm to everything, no? 
but now he's not seeing that one anymore. That presence is missing. So things don't have charm anymore. They are not attractive, they are not delightful. And he's not perceiving the glory of which all these forms are dim signs. Hmm? He lacks, he feels an emptiness that he's missing that glory because he's had a little glimpse of it, he knows what it is. Hmm? So he's missing it. The world continues to exist, the world lived on, but the cause by which the world exists, everything that makes this world worthy to exist, seems to be not there. It's as if the world is empty of its cause, that is missing. It's an experience, he says, like love when the beloved's face is gone. You're still in love, but where is she? Yeah. Yuli? The labor to know seemed a vain <laughs> strength of mind. All knowledge ended in the unknowable. The effort to rule seemed a vain pride of will. The trivial achievements formed by time. All power retired into the omnipotent. Thank you. So this is what he's been trying to do all the time. He's been making this tremendous effort. Hmm? The labor to know. He's been searching for knowledge, for true experience. But now, in this state that he's in now, this labor to know just seems like some useless struggle of the mind, strife. Uh, struggle and clash and conflict. No? Because all knowledge, he's hunted everywhere, he's grasped or touched all knowledge, but all knowledge seems to end in the unknowable, what cannot be known. The effort to rule. He's a king, he's supposed to rule and he's been given power to rule more and more. But that effort, the effort needed to rule, seemed a vain pride of will. As if it's just the will's own wish to rule. And why? Because in fact, all power, all power is drawn back it belongs to the omnipotent. Retired, draws back into the omnipotent. So it's a strange kind of helpless, bewildered state that he is in. Trivial mm achievement. -hmm. <coughs> Where does the trivial come? A trivial achievement scorned by time. Yes, if you rule, you're a great man, you're very, very powerful, but that achievement that you've won is something so small and meaningless, trivial. It has no value. And time pours scorn on it, because how long will your rule last? In no time you will be gone and uh, Yes, a trivial, scorned by time. Time says, you are nothing. No? How many brief years are you going to rule? No? Yuli. A tree of darkness guards the eternal light. A silence Settled on his striving heart, absorbed from the voices of the world's desire, he turned to the ineffable timeless call. A 
cave of darkness guards the eternal light. This is a spiritual experience that many mystics and seekers have reported that somehow to come into contact with the eternal light one has to pass through a kind of darkness it's been called a cloud of unknowing a state in which you don't know anything Savitri also uh, later on we shall see she passes through this state so that's what he's now seeing that there's this cave of darkness which guards the eternal light and makes the eternal light seem to be something unknowable. Mm -hmm. So now a silence settled on his striving heart. It's as if all that energy, that tremendous energy of aspiration that, he's, that has carried him on this great journey, it all falls silent. He's absolved from the voices of the world's desire. Absolved is a very interesting word and it's interesting the way Sri Aurobindo uses this word in different places in the poem. Literally it means that um, something's washed away from you. It's connected with dissolved. Mm -hmm. It's as if some pure purity, something comes and washes away. And so it's absolved, it's washed away from you. You are left free. And in this case, he has been, by all these experiences, and this state that he's entered into now, he's absolved, he's set free from all those voices of the world's desire which are uh, coming to us all the time and making us think that we want this and we want that. Sorry? In the Christian, in the Christian context, it is, yes, that because of the grace of the Lord or because of confession, uh, in some way, your sins are washed away and you're innocent and pure again. No? So he, what he, in this case, what he is free from, it's those voices of desire which are traveling around in the world all the time and get hold of us all the time. They can't touch him anymore. No? Because he has felt the timeless call that call which is beyond time and not limited by time of the ineffable that which cannot be expressed that which can't be put into words there's something ineffable that we a kind of eternal mystery that we can't say anything about but that's what's really attracting us on our upward journey and now he's become conscious of that call and so all the other calls the voices of the world's desire they don't touch him anymore at all line 20 oh, yes unnameable a wide compelling ecstasy and peace felt in himself and all and yet ungrasped, <clears throat> approached and faded from his soul's pursuit as if forever luring him beyond. Thank you. So what he's missing is ineffable, unknowable, but it's a being, mm -hmm. a being intimate, something that's very close, actually very familiar. 
and yet unnameable. It's not possible to put a name to it. At the same time as being a being, it's also a vastness, something impersonal, a wide, compelling ecstasy and peace. So bliss, ecstasy, intense feeling, and yet with that peace, wide, vast, and that, that's compelling. It, it has a powerful uh, effect which has to be responded to. That wide, compelling ecstasy and peace, he feels it in himself. He feels it in all, in the whole world and all the forms, and yet he can't grasp it, can't get hold of it. Sometimes it's close, approached, and faded from his soul's pursuit. Sometimes the soul feels it very near and compelling, and then there are other times when it seems almost not to exist. And that experience is as if that being and that vastness is luring him. This is what Krishna does with his flute. No? He comes near you, you get a glimpse, you hear the flute, and then it's far away. You have to run after him. No? But it, it's compelling, it's so attractive, you have to run after it. It's the same in the story of uh, the Ramayana, uh, that golden deer comes and Sita sees it and she has to have it. And she sends Rama to go and catch that deer for her. And it's luring when, when he's near it goes further and when it's far away he just gets a glimpse of it and he has to run after it. Uh, Joel, yes. In near it retreated, far it called him still. Nothing could satisfy but its delight, its absence left the greatest actions done. Its presence makes the smallest seem divine. I don't have to explain this. It's all perfectly clear. No? Helian. When it was there, the heart's edit was filled. But when the uplifting died in the room, existence lost its aim in the inner. Yes. So when it, that presence, was there, then the heart, that empty heart, feels absolutely satisfied. As though it's so deep, it's an abyss, a deep, immeasurable abyss. But when that divine presence, that uplifting divine presence, fades away, when it withdraws, it's as if just existence has no meaning at all. What is, what is the aim of existence? In the inane, the meaningless, what is empty of significance. And then he gives examples, um, Leila. The burden of the Indian things, the good life, the fullness of the experience, were turned to force for an impermanent assume. You can read the next line also. But who that mightiness was in you not yet. Yes. So these are 
Existence losing its aim in the inane. What is existence? He's experienced this order of all these planes which I showed you in the painting. Yeah? The immemorial planes, the planes that have lasted for as long as memory has lasted. The godlike fullness of the instruments. The instruments, our body, all our vital capacities, our life capacities, our mental capacities, our inner capacities, these are all the instruments of the being. You know? And even when they are absolutely fully developed and very, very powerful, if that presence is not there, they can it all seem meaningless. You know? they, they are turned to props for an impermanent scene. It's an image um, from the theater, no? That uh, you have props, you have these things that you, the actors use to help them convey the scene that they have to convey. But it's an impermanent scene. It doesn't last long, and if the actors aren't there, if the actor is not there to use the props, what are they? They are just useless objects lying around with ha that have no significance and no value. So even that, all these immemorial planes, everything that makes up the universe, and all the powers you know, that are instruments for that one to express him or itself. If the presence isn't there, what are they? But he doesn't know who that mightiness is. He doesn't yet know what is that presence that he's missing. What is that being that gives meaning to everything? Uh, Leila. <laughs> Filling all that is, it made and blotted out a million words, and took and lost a thousand shapes and names. Mm. Impalpable means it can't be felt, can't be touched. And yet there he feels it, although it can't be touched, it's impalpable, it can't be felt. He feels it filling everything that is. It creates everything. Mm -hmm. It made, it created all these worlds and blotted them out, wiped them out, destroyed them. It has the power to do that. Mm? It took a thousand shapes and names shows itself in all these many, many different forms and all these many, many different names and then it lets them go. And then again he gives examples, um, Patricia. It wore the guise of an indiscernible vast or was a subtle kernel in the soul. A distant greatness left it huge and dim. A mystic closeness shut it sweetly in. It seemed sometimes a figment or a robe, and seemed sometimes his own colossus shade. You can read the next line. A giant doubt <coughs> overshadowed his advance. Thank you. So it, that presence which he's missing, it wore the disguise, the, the guise, the appearance. Sometimes it appears as a vastness, something which can't be discerned, it can't be seen or felt or sometimes a subtle kernel 
in the soul. The kernel is the very, very center of the fruit from which everything grows. <clears throat> and sometimes this feeling of a distant greatness, he has the feeling of something dim, huge, very, very enormous. Well, sometimes, or maybe at the same time, there's this mystic closeness, something that is mysteriously very, very close, shutting it sweetly in. Sometimes it seems like a figment, something made up by the imagination, something that the mind has manufactured. Or a robe, a covering, and seemed sometimes as if it's his own colossal shade, a huge shadow of himself. So faced with that unknowableness, he feels doubt. Hmm? A giant doubt overshadowed his advance. We can't move forward unless we have some faith that leads us forward. No? If we're in doubt, we're stuck, we go round and round in circles, we can't find our way. So he's been moving so steadily forward. Mm. But now suddenly there's this doubt and he has to find his way out of that. Maybe we read one more sentence you'd like to go on. Um, Mahalingam. A cross in neutral or supporting wall, whose blankness neck is alone in mortal spirit, are you towards an recondite supreme, aided, acquired by enigmatic powers, aspiring and half seeking and upward, invincibly he has ended without cause? Mm. So. So he goes on, although there's this giant doubt overshadowing his advance, he continues across this void, this emptiness, which is supporting everything, neutral, it's not for or against, it's not this, it's not that, it's just supporting. Hmm? It's blank, it says it's blankness nursed his immortal spirit. There's something about that neutral blankness which nourishes his immortal part. He's allured, attracted towards some recondite supreme. Something that's recondite is again hidden, it's hidden by complexity. There, there's so much uh, around it that to find the thing itself is difficult. He's helped, aided, and even coerced. There, sometimes he has no choice. He's pushed this way or that way by enigmatic powers, powers that he doesn't understand, that are mysterious, enigmatic, something that is a riddle to you, you do not understand. He's aspiring, that is always his movement, is to uh, long for the higher and the truer. He's aspiring and half sinking, and then something holds him up, carries him up, upborn, carried upwards, invincibly, he ascended without pause. So he goes on 
moving upwards, even though sometimes it's difficult, even though there are coercing powers. Maybe those coercing powers coerce him on the right way, carry him up. He ascended without pause. I think we'll stop there for today. We can take the time to read these lines from the beginning together, slowly hoping to understand them better now the second time we read them. All is too little that the world can give. Its power and knowledge are the gifts of time and cannot fill the spirit's sacred thirst. Although of one these forms of greatness are, and by its breath of grace our lives abide, Although more near to us than nearness self, it is some utter truth of what we are. Hidden by its own works, it seemed far off, impenetrable, occult, voiceless, obscure. The presence was lost by which all things have charm. The glory lacked of which they are dim signs. The world lived on made empty of its course, like love when the beloved's face is gone. The labor to know seemed a vain strife of mind. All knowledge ended in the unknowable. The effort to rule seemed a vain pride of will, a trivial achievement scorned by time. All power retired into the omnipotent. A cave of darkness guards the eternal light. A silence settled on his striving heart. Absolved from the voices of the world's desire, he turned to the ineffable's timeless call. A being intimate and unnameable, a wide, compelling ecstasy and peace felt in himself and all and yet ungrasped, approached and faded from his soul's pursuit as if forever luring him beyond. Near it retreated, far it called him still. Nothing could satisfy but its delight. Its absence left the greatest actions dull. Its presence made the smallest seem divine.
When it was there, the heart's abyss was filled. But when the uplifting deity withdrew, Existence lost its aim in the inane. The order of the immemorial planes, the godlike fullness of the instruments, were turned to props for an impermanent scene. But who that mightiness was, he knew not yet. Impalpable, yet filling all that is, it made and blotted out a million worlds, and took and lost a thousand shapes and names. It wore the guise of an indiscernible vast, or was a subtle kernel in the soul, a distant greatness left it huge and dim, a mystic closeness shut it sweetly in. It seemed sometimes a figment or a robe, and seemed sometimes his own colossal shade. A giant doubt overshadowed his advance. Across a neutral, all-supporting void, whose blankness nursed his lone immortal spirit, allured towards some recondite supreme, aided, coerced, by enigmatic powers, aspiring and half-sinking and upborn, invincibly he ascended without pause.